on freedom and human flourishing. Thou shalt is the great dragon cold, but the spirit of the lion saith, I will. Thou shalt lieth in its path, sparkling with gold, a scale-covered beast, and on every scale glittereth golden. Thou shalt. Nietzsche, thus spoke Zarathustra. Comedies of Misanthropy and the Hive Mind. One of the most disappointing things about the past couple of years has been being reminded rather dramatically that so many people simply want to be told what to do. And it's not just that they want to be told what to do, it's that they want you to be told what to do too. If you're free and they're not, they're willing to su submit, their hunger for it will be exposed. They'll be seen for the desperate creatures they are, looking upward with their knees in the muck, begging for the next command. Like dogs, but half as loving and far less loyal. Maintaining the illusion of free will for them requires perfectly synchronized choreography with everyone stepping in time, nodding and affirming with painfully strained ear-to-ear -ear grins. Conformity hates questions and knows that any lie might as well be the truth if everyone agrees to repeat it. No one wants to admit that they want to be told what to do, but still, they do. I don't understand it, and it frustrates me, but with some disappointment, I do have to admit that it is human, all too human. And in admitting that, I acknowledge that my hopes for humans are perhaps inhuman and possibly even inhumane. The misanthrope despises man because he wants him to be other than he is. And he makes a ridiculous spectacle of himself, shouting at armadillos and commanding them to fly. While I do have hope, I try not to be a misanthrope, because a misanthrope is a silly and self-hating thing to be. I rather like myself, and I'm a person too, so they can't be all bad. There is goodness in many, and greatness in some, but most people are just people, and to expect them to be something different entirely is yet another definition of insanity. Human, all too human, or is freedom just another word for nothing and no one left to lose? I know that my world-weary snark seems to be aimed at the so-called liberals who have shown that they aren't interested in liberty so much as a pleasant rhetoric of permissiveness frosted over a fascist cupcake, as long as it is topped by sprinkles of many colors. That fruitcake fascist sugar bomb is just sitting there. It's ready to eat, and it's easy to turn down. I see the same tendencies in the reactionary no-sugar crowd like their pastry-loving predecessors. These reactionaries, too, are hungry for a tightly controlled hive consciousness. Now, they've been relieved of the power to impose their own order on the multitude. So now, they shout, freedom! But it's a revolt of sour grapes. So many of them, want to be controlled, or they want to control other people. To tell or be told what to do and where to do it. They chafe against the new authority, but cry out for a set of commandments. They have turned away from the bakery of the new normal, but remain ravenous for rules. Please, Lord, send me a meme graphic that tells me what to eat and what not to eat, and what to wear, and what I should buy. 
what I should dream and when I should ejaculate. Please, Lord, send me thou shouts so that I know what to do. Rules give us a sense of an ordered world. And when people around us agree on the same rules, it creates an atmosphere of comfort and belonging. I've spent enough time with so-called nonconformists to know how quickly they conform and enough time around self-proclaimed misanthropes to know how much they really want to trust men and belong. True independence is rare. And truthfully, loners accomplish very little alone. Integrity. I'm self-aware enough to admit that I've given away little pieces of myself to belong and to feel included. I'm not so different or special and I'm not immune. When I find myself welcomed into a circle, I start to self-censor. We all do it. I find myself tempted to wink, nod, and dog whistle for the easy applause. I'll admit that I've done it when speaking to white nationalists, and I've done it when speaking to Christians. And if you think one of those things felt less dirty, then you're wrong. You know, I, I've noticed that there's a Christian vibe this year with all the superior prudery and hatred and, frankly, the adversarial cackling Satanism of the early teens alt-right. This doesn't apply to all Christians, many of whom I like very much. It's just an observation, something, a phenomenon that uh, I've been observing with a wary sense of deja vu. So keep your new hashtag nationalisms. I see you. I know what you are, and I don't trust you just because you put a cross on it. Nothing feels quite as much like spiritual harlotry as telling people what they want to hear when you don't believe it. At that point, you're just a salesman or a politician performing the art of the possible or, nodding to popular definitions, a journalist. I'm human too. We all want to belong. We all want to be liked. Anyone who says that they don't want to be liked and they don't care what anyone else thinks is a liar or a psychopath. You can't be part of any group unless you are willing to pick some battles and let some other things go. And there's something obnoxiously adolescent about a man who feels the need to quibble over every minor detail. But there's also an addictive to allure to making your own idiosyncratic vision of perfection the enemy of that which is good, or at least better, to the extent that you relieve yourself of the responsibility to act or work towards positive change because you've predetermined that nothing and no one will ever be good enough. The big temptation to be wary of is abandoning all of our core principles and our individual integrity to please people and affirm them and to, in turn, be affirmed by them. If you're doing that, your voice is not for those ears and you just move on to another crowd. If you keep telling people what they want to hear instead of what you believe, you're the kind of prostitute who lets people put words in your mouth which is the dirtiest and most dishonest kind of tramp. As I mentioned recently, men have a tendency to overcorrect dramatically, to commit to the one perfect solution that happens to resemble the polar opposite of the problem. Eudaimonia. I wanted this essay to be about the Greek concept of eudaimonia, because for some reason, I thought that it referred to finding some kind of balance that leads to a harmony of human flourishing. But after perusing a number of secondary sources, it became clear that it doesn't mean that at all, and that the Greeks really couldn't even agree on what it actually meant, or at any rate, how to get there. 
It means something like good spirit or happiness, but always more than the empty-headed happiness of a simple pleasure, like a cupcake with sprinkles. Eudaimonia refers to overall happiness. All of the Greeks seemed to agree that eudaimonia was desirable, but beyond that, there was a great deal of contention among philosophical schools. For some, that happiness came from virtue and wisdom, and for others, it came from pleasure and a freedom from pain that attended a quasi-Buddhist freedom from want or attachment. Philosophy means the love of wisdom. And one of the fundamental questions of philosophy, one of the fundamental questions that it attempts to answer is, how does one live well? Or in the language of Conan, what is best in life? Philosophers have tried to answer this question, and men have no doubt been debating it since Uga Booga, but they have never agreed on an answer. There has always been contention. And this should tell us something. Total philosophical consensus is an impossibility, except when achieved artificially and temporarily at the end of a barrel or a blunt object. Perhaps we always should have known. The wisdom that philosophy gestured toward is Sophia, a feminine noun and a woman's name. And as a woman, she will always be changeable and mysterious to us. What is best in life? Conan has his answer. It's not a wrong answer, but if that's your only answer, you're probably not going to have a lot of opportunities to experience that which is best in life. The truth is that there are many answers, and there always have been. Eudaimonia isn't a beanie. It's not one size fits all. I like the Japanese concept of ikigai, happiness that is derived from being motivated by a sense of purpose and a sense of progressive accomplishment. That sounds a little closer to what happiness means to me than any of the Greek takes on it. But that's just me. You know, I know and love people who don't feel called to any greater purpose whatsoever. And some of them are living in better spirit than many who do feel that calling. Freedom and the terrible tyranny of a single solution. So what does it mean to be free? Prisoners aren't free. Slaves aren't free. Prisoners and slaves can't come and go as they please. And their choices are restricted by someone else. They're told what to do and threatened with violence if they don't do it and do it exactly as they were told to do it. As a free man, I am skeptical of the Eastern idea that freedom from attachment is desirable. As a free man, I likewise find the anarchist idea of freedom rather childish. I don't really believe that freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. I want the freedom to move. I want the freedom to associate with whomever I please. I want the freedom to disagree and say what I believe, even if I'm wrong, because sometimes you have to stumble into being right. You don't always nail it on the first try. In fact, you usually don't. And I want you to be free to disagree with me and to stumble into your own version of whatever works for you. You know, America's founding fathers clearly missed some very important details, but they got a lot of things right. The right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of eudaimonia. And maybe an American chauvinist, but that still sounds just right to my ears. And what the freedom to pursue happiness really is, what it really means to pursue good spirit and human flourishing, is to be free to seek out and determine your own solutions to the challenges of life. If your friends aren't making you better in a way that's making you happier or more virtuous or more fulfilled, more of whatever you want to be in life, then find new friends. If you don't like what they're doing over here or how they're living over here, you should be free to go over there and see if it's a better fit. 
And there always needs to be an over there. There have always been different people living life differently in different places. And there have always been different communities. The Greeks had numerous schools of thought and many thought leaders. Some went this way and some went that way, and they never really agreed on everything. There have always been competing opinions and competing religions and competing political factions. And when there aren't, when there's only one choice, that is always where top-down tyranny begins. I have met a lot of guys who run their own lives in different ways. And they do things that I don't approve of or agree with. Some of them are really screwed up and they're either playing themselves and you know they'll figure it out or they won't. But I've also found some guys who have found ways to make the best of very unorthodox situations. And they are truthfully living better and in better spirit than those who are trying to do what they think they're supposed to do. I've also met a lot of guys who are living fairly normal lives and doing exactly what they think they're supposed to do, and they are truly living well. I don't want their lives, but they are doing what is best for them. It is the people who believe that they have all of the answers to all of the questions, and they want to impose the same set of solutions on everyone whether they are labeled right or left, whether they are religious or anti-religious, it is those people who are the true enemies of freedom and human flourishing.